Hello everyone, Dr. Data Science here. Today we are going to talk about conformal prediction. Conformal prediction is a framework for quantifying uncertainty in the predictions made by arbitrary machine learning algorithms. This means that you can apply conformal prediction to linear regression or a complex neural network model or logistic regression. Um, and the idea is that you can use this base machine learning model and uh, use conformal prediction as uh, a sort of like a post-processing technique to establish a reliable measure of prediction uncertainty. Therefore, if you're working in the areas of machine learning, data science, this is definitely something you want to uh, add to your uh, tool sets. Uh, and today we are going to start with the problem formulation and then talk about the score functions that are really important in conformal prediction and then talk about one classification and one regression problem. And finally, we were going to uh, look at the Python implementation of conformal prediction. This means that you don't have to use uh, fancy existing libraries and you're able to really implement this on your own and understand how conformal prediction uh, works. So at its core, as we said, conformal prediction leverages statistical principles to establish a reliable measure of prediction uncertainty. And the very nice advantage of conformal prediction is that it does not rely on a specific modeling assumptions, uh, such as Gaussian distributions or other assumptions that we usually uh, consider in other uh, uncertainty quantification techniques. And therefore, conformal prediction is very versatile. And in this notebook or in this video, uh, we're going to discuss three main ingredients of conformal prediction, or I'm going to just basically write and, and let's say CP for short for conformal prediction. So to start, um, let's say that we have a set of N IID feature response pairs. So the idea is that these XIs are the inputs and YIs are the outputs. And obviously the goal is to predict them. Uh, for a new test data point. And here we are assuming that uh, they are IID or independent and identically distributed. And later on, we're going to relax this assumption. The next assumption that we make here is that we have this parameter alpha that represents uh, the error level. And so uh, typically we want this alpha to be uh, close to zero, right? Because we want to have low um, error rate. And so what is the goal of uh, conformal prediction is to find a prediction set. Uh, and we show this using this C hat so that it's a mapping from the input space to a subset of the output space uh, with the probability that now if you have a new test data point, so here the test data point, I use the index n plus one to, to refer to it, that if you build this prediction set, the probability that the ground truth output or the actual output for the test data point falls within this prediction set is at least one minus alpha. So there are two things here. One minus alpha in this context, we can think of this as the target coverage level, right? Because we want to cover uh, the, the, the sort of like the prediction set here that we have. And the second thing is that this probability is taken over all of our data, meaning that the data that we had, those end data points that we just talked about, and also the test data point. That's why this index i goes from one to n plus one. Okay, so this is something that we always have to keep in mind uh, in this video, that we want to find this prediction set uh, such that the probability that it contains the target output or the actual output is at least one minus alpha. Let's look at the trivial solution. So it turns out that we can easily solve this problem uh, just by creating this prediction set such that it's equal to the total uh, uh, output space that we have with probability one minus alpha. And then we, we return an empty set with probability alpha. So what this means is that let's say you have a binary classification problem, which means that you have two classes like zero and one. In this case, with probability one minus alpha, you return both labels that we can get. And with probability alpha, we don't return anything. And this can 
you know, you can show that um, you get exactly one minus alpha coverage, right? Because on average, one minus alpha pr portion of uh, these sort of like prediction sets contain will contain the the, the true output, right? But this is a you know a, a useless solution because um, it doesn't really uh, tell us anything about the uncertainty of uh, the the machine learning model that that we want to analyze, and therefore the the question that here we really want to answer using conformal prediction is that how can we achieve this probability that the ground truth output for the test data point belongs to the prediction set is at least one minus alpha in finite samples, right? So meaning that when we have a, a limited number of data points um, and, our, and the other sort of like condition here is that we want to adjust the size of this prediction set based on how difficult it is to predict the, the output for the test data point, right? So if we can do this, then we can use the size of the prediction set as a, as a way of measuring the uncertainty in the predictions of the machine learning model. So one thing that you hear a lot anytime talking about conformal prediction is quantile. So let's really briefly review these. So what is a quantile? Um, so a quantile is a value below which a certain portion of the data values will lie, right? Um, so here, like, let's say you have these like B numbers, S1 through SB, and if you want to find the one minus alpha quantile of these, you know, real numbers, S1 through SB, we use this notation, quantile, and then these numbers, and then the, the level that we want. And this is defined um, using uh, the, this sort of like definition that we have here. So the most important thing is what we have here, this one that you can see. So this is the indicator function. So if this uh, this condition is met, you get one. So we, we basically count uh, the number of times that the values that we get in these uh, B real numbers are less than or equal uh, this threshold Q. And we want to uh, have this portion that means that if you normalize this by the total number of samples that we have in this set here, we at least get one minus alpha, right? And in order to make sure that, again, this is not a trivial problem, we are looking at the infimum or minimum value for this threshold uh, Q, right? Because otherwise we can always uh, pick the maximum value in the in this set of real numbers that we have. And we obviously will satisfy this one minus alpha coverage that we want. So, but the idea is that what is the smallest possible uh, Q such that we have one minus alpha portion of data below Q. So now let's talk about three ingredients of CP or, or conformal prediction. The first one is what is known as order statistics. So what does this mean? For now, let's think about it that we don't have any features at all and you just have a bunch of outputs, right? So how can I find the probability that the output for the test data point is less than or equal to some Q hat with probability at least one minus alpha, right? So the idea here is that if you use that IID assumption, right, you can think about it this way, that the rank of the test data point is uniformly distributed over the values of Y1 to Yn plus one, right? So this means that think about it this way, that you're going to rank these values of these outputs from a smallest to largest, right? And then because we have this ID assumption, the rank of this Yn plus one can be anywhere in sort of like that order list that we have. And if you write this mathematically, this means that the probability that the Yn plus one is among the one minus alpha n plus one smallest of these n plus one numbers is at least one minus alpha, right? So that's the idea of order statistics. So we have a small problem here because then in order to find this probability, we need to know the exact value of the output for the test data point, and we do not have that. So in order to uh, resolve this problem, what we can do is that we can complement this probability argument that we have here. So the probability that yn plus n plus one is greater than one minus alpha and plus one, the smallest of these numbers, then is less than alpha, right? This is one minus one minus alpha. So, and then what we can use here is use the fact that yn plus one cannot be greater than itself. So now we can get 
rid of this. And what this tells us is that the probability of y n plus one is greater than one minus alpha n plus one, the smallest of these n numbers is less than alpha. And now if we can, we, we use the complement of this probability argument that we have here, you can see that the probability of y n plus one less than or equal one minus alpha n plus one, the smallest of these numbers is at least uh, one minus alpha. So this means that that Q hat that we originally asked for, this one, can be calculated using this very simple formula, which is, uh, and, and this notation is also the ceiling, right? Meaning that if you don't get an integer, you're gonna round up, right? So one minus alpha n plus one, the smallest of these n numbers that you have in your, uh, we can think about in your training data or available data. So let's apply the same idea to, to a regression problem, right? So let's say you have a f hat x, which is a, a regression model, or which gives you a prediction for any uh, input x. And now in this case, let's look at the residuals, right? So residuals are actual values minus predicted values. And you can calculate these for the n data points, because remember for the first n data points, we know the actual outputs, these yi's. And then you can use q hat as one minus alpha, n plus one, the smallest of these n numbers. And now you can see how you can actually form a prediction set uh, using these, uh, you know, uh, these are these sort of like, you know, uh, quantile that we have found here. So idea is that for x n plus one, we want to find all the output values or y's such that the residual, right? And in this case, we know actually what this f hat x n plus one is less than or equal to q hat. And q hat is something that we just found here, right? So if you just expand this, you can show that this is equivalent to uh, saying that y is between f hat minus q hat and f hat plus q hat, right? That, that's what basically this means. So this means that you found the actual prediction interval that you are looking for for this regression problem. Except that now we have a small problem because for the first n data points that used for training, the machine learning model f hat um, has seen those. So we expect that the residuals for those are smaller, but for the test data point, we have not seen the, uh, the that input output pair during the training. And so if your model does overfitting, this means that now that residual is probably significantly higher than the residuals for the training data points. And what this basically means is that the rank of the residual for the test data point Rn plus one is not uniformly distributed, which is violating the assumption that we had in ingredient one. So how can we solve this problem? This is what takes us to the ingredient two of uh, CP, and that's the calibration set. So the idea here is that you have some available data. You divide that into two sets, one for training, and then the other one for calibration purposes. And then here mainly work with indices of these training and calibration samples. I call the first set D1, the second set D2. And here we have N1 data points and N2 data points. And now use the set D1 for model fitting. And then you use the second set or D2 for finding residuals. So if you look at here, we find these residuals just for those samples that belong to the set D2. And then we find the quantile for those residuals, right? That exact same thing, one minus alpha, and here N2 plus one, because we have N2 residuals. And finally, we can fill the prediction interval here, which is this F hat minus Q hat, that's the lower bound. And then the upper bound for the interval is F hat plus Q hat. So now we are very close to uh, fully understand conformal prediction by looking at the third and last ingredient, and that's this idea of a score function, right? So right now we use residuals as negatively oriented score functions, and negatively oriented means that lower values are better. However, we can use a general conformity score in the calibration set. And that's why we use using this S function, which accepts an input and output pair. And this gives us basically, in some sense, how uh, conformal 
uh, these sort of like, you know, input output pairs are, meaning that lower values are better. Think about this as residual, for example. And once you find these scores, uh, you can build a prediction set for any test data point X. I'm uh, omitting the, the subscript here, such that the conformal score for that test data point is less than or equal to the quantile that you find is one minus alpha n two plus one smallest of SI values. But the thing that you need to consider here that a conformity score can actually be positively oriented, meaning that higher scores are more desirable. What is an example of this? Like for example, softmax scores and classifications. In that case, higher values are more desirable because it means that the probability that that data point belongs to one class is um, basically higher, right? It's very close to one in, in that case. And we can, in this case, uh, make a small adjustment when you want to build a prediction set. And the only thing you need to consider is that now higher values are better. So you want to find the alpha n2 plus one as smallest values, such that now one minus alpha portion of your data is on the right side of this threshold rather than the left side, right? That's like the only major um, difference here. But for the most part in, 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 in this video, we're gonna work with negatively oriented scores so that you don't have to uh, worry about these two sort of like ways of building prediction sets. So now let's just uh, summarize and recap everything that, that we just said. So if you use a negatively oriented score, you want to find the values of Y such that the conformity score is less than or equal to this threshold. And remember the, the, the formal definition of quantile that we just mentioned, if you divide this by N2, that's exactly the definition of the quantile. Um, and now you can use all the built-in Python, NumPy, uh, methods to, to, to find this, right? So this means that now this is the fraction of data that you want to be less than or equal to, to this uh, number. And this is what is known as the adjusted level because you have this N2 plus one in the numerator and N2 in the denominator. So this is very close to one, but obviously it's not exactly one because you have N plus one in the, in the numerator. Uh, but you you saw that word you know we we get this from is because of the way that we had to get rid of y n plus one in the first probabilistic argument that that we have, and so it is very easy to remember the formula here for conformal prediction. It's that test score should be less than or equal to adjusted quantile. So that's what you really need. The other thing we want to talk about here is this idea of exchangeability, right? So exchangeability is something that we really need here, right? To be able to uh, use conformal prediction, which is a weaker assumption than the independent and identically distributed or IID assumption. So what is the for definition of exchangeability? So if we have these n plus one numbers here, this y1 to yn plus one, so they're exchangeable if their joint distribution is unchanged under permutations, right? So this sigma here, refers to all possible permutations. And so if we permute these, meaning that we, we don't really uh, you know, care about the order that we receive about these, then that's you know, in distribution, we call this uh, exchangeable. So here I have an example for you if you're not familiar with exchangeability. So let's say you have uh, a basket that contains three balls, right? So one red and two blue, right? And you draw out these balls one at a time and without replacement, and uh, you note the color. And based on that, you define a random variable, right? If it's uh, a, a red, you get one. If it's blue, you get zero. And based on now, because you, you have to pick three balls or draw out three balls, you have uh, you know three random variables. So obviously, these random variables are not independent because you do this sampling without replacement, meaning that if what you pick in the first try, then it will impact what you will pick in the second try, right? So that's that's something to keep in mind here. But we want to see whether these things are exchangeable or not. So in order to do that, we need to find their, their joint distribution, right? And so here we have x1 equals x1, x2 equals x2, x3 equals x3, and we have to consider all possible permutations of one, zero, and zero. So in order to find this probability, so if the first one is the red ball, that's one third of cases, right? One out of three balls. And after that, you just end up with blue balls. So which means that 
for sure the other two random variables are zeros. And for the other cases, right? So if you want to first pick the blue ball, that's two uh, third because you have two out of three balls. And then there is like this one half or, or one over two for the other case because one is red, one is blue. So you can see all these joint distributions are one third, which means that yes, they are exchangeable, but they are not independent, right? So that's the idea of exchangeability, which means that the order doesn't matter, meaning that in this case, it, it, it doesn't matter if you pick the red ball first or the blue ball, at the end you get this same joint distribution. So let's look at the general CP instructions um, now that we understand all the steps of CP or conformal prediction. You start with the heuristic notion of uncertainty on a model train on D1. Um, and, and, and this basically means residual, softmax scores, all of these are heuristic notion of uncertainty. And then you define the score function such that higher scores represent worse agreement between X and Y or lower values are better. That's another way of saying that. You find the quantile, right? This quantile of these the scores that you find at this adjusted level. And then you want to look for all the Y values for test data points such that the uh, score function rest and recall this Q hat. So now let's look at a, a very concrete example with, with softmax scores, right? That's what you get when you use like logistic regression or use like neural networks. At the, the very last layer, you typically use the softmax um, layer so that or softmax function so that you get a probability distribution over classes. And since we want to have a negatively oriented score, we look at one minus softmax output of the true class, right? So this means that if that probability, the softmax output is close to one, which means that we are very confident. Then one minus one, we get zero, which means that now lower values are better. So that's the definition. And this notation here means that look at the element uh, index by yi of these softmax um, scores that you get. And then you find the quantile, and then you can show that now you want to have this softmax score, which is one minus, uh, uh, F hat of Y, so that's our conformal score, to be less than or equal to Q hat. And if you do like some simple math here, you can show that this means that this F hat, the softmax score of those uh, classes for test data points, um, there are at least one minus Q hat. We are going to add them to the prediction set that, that we had. So let's start implementing this now, now that I understand how this works. So the very first thing I want to talk about, if you have like a metrics of all softmax scores, how we can pick these sort of like, you know, uh, softmax scores of the true output. That's something that we need to do very efficiently, hopefully without using for loop. So in order to do this, I create a, a random um, normal metrics of size two by three. Think about it as having two samples and, and three classes. And in this case, I'm going to divide each row First, I'm going to take the exponential of all the values to make sure that they're all positives, and then I'm going to divide by the sum of each row. So in this case, you can see we get a valid probability distribution for each row, like if, which means that if you add all these elements in the first row, you get one. The same thing with the second row, you get one. And let's say in this, you know, synthetic or artificially generated data, the first uh, row or the first data point belongs to class one. And because indexing starts from zero, that means class two, technically, this one. And then the second row belongs to class one, which is this 0.69 score. Obviously, the, the non, not recommended option is to use sort of like a for loop, right? Um, here, I'm using this enumerate, uh, which means that um, I'm going to look at the, the, the index for the row, the index for the true class, and I'm going to pick these two elements, right? Like 0 0.53, 0 0.69, you can see it here. One option is to just pass these labels here, as you can see in this cell. But this is not going to work because what is happening is that you're going to pick the second row, or say it's the second column, which is this 53 and 22, and you bring it here. And then the first column, which is 0 0.34 and 0 0.69, and that's not what we wanted to do. We just wanted to pick this 0 0.53 and 0 0.69. So the way that you can get around this problem is actually by saying that now for the row axis, we have this np.arrange2, which means that now you have 0 and 1. And for labels, we have 1 and 0. 
And this is able to quickly go and efficiently go through the metrics and pick up all those um, uh, softmax scores that, that we have to uh, look at for, for finding this uh, quantile. So for reproducibility, let's look at a synthetic example where we use multivariate normal distribution in a two-dimensional space with these means and covariance matrices. You know, the means are two by one, covariance matrices are two by two. Um, we generate these data points, we stack them together, and then we are gonna uh, uh, plot them. So you can see this is the data set that you know now we have with these three classes that we have. And then obviously we have to now have a train calibration and test data set because you wanna see whether we get uh, that one minus alpha coverage that we have. Um, so you can see that first I divide the data one third of it for testing and then whatever we have left, I use half of it for testing, which means that we divide the data uh, into three uh, equally sized uh, like subsets, one for training, calibration and testing. And in this case, for simplicity, let's use logistic regression. Um, you know that when you use logistic regression, you can do the feeding. And then for prediction part, you can use this predict underscore prob, uh, which stands for probability. And this will give you all the uh, softmax scores that we are looking for, right? That's the softmax scores for the first row or first data point, second, and et cetera. As we just mentioned earlier, um, using the trick that we have, you can just go through these entire metrics and find those probabilities or softmax scores that correspond to the true class. That's this Y cal here. And then obviously the softmax, uh, the, the conformity scores are one minus softmax scores. Um, and these are the numbers that you get, right? So now we want to look at the impact of the, 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 the alpha or one minus alpha on these quantile values, right? So you can just write a simple function to, to find this adjusted Q level and then use the numpy's np.quantile to, to find the quantile um, for, for each level that you decide. And then we have another function here that we can visualize and, and plot these quantiles, right? So that's like where we use this plt.vlines, the vertical lines, and we provide those quantiles. So here we can see the result that for three different values of alpha, like 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 0.2, we're gonna find the quantiles um, and then we're gonna uh, uh, um, plot them, right? So you can see that here, this line, the blue one is for alpha 0 0.05 and then the orange one and, and then the green one, right? And this is the distribution of all the scores. So as you can see here, as you um, increase alpha, right? Uh, this means that uh, a, a smaller portion should be on the right side of these lines, right? So for that reason, we're going to shift this or move these lines closer to zero, right? So if you want to be confident, like 95% of time, what a typical value of conformity is score is, right? So then you get something like close to 0.8. But then if you want to be you know, only like 80% confident what the value is, like 0.4 is definitely like enough according to, to these uh, quantiles that we have here. But now let's focus on, you know, for example, the, the first choice of alpha, which was like 0 0.05, which means that we want a coverage of 95% if you plug in it back to the first definition that we have because we have one minus alpha. So in, in this case, you can form the, prediction set for each data point. So you can see that for each test data point, that's why, that's why I'm here working with X test. For example, for the first one, you get true, false, false. So this means that it, although here we are able to, to predict more than one class for each data point, we think that it only belongs to the first class. Um, the same thing, um, for example, if you do the same um, argument for the second row, you can see that now it belongs to the class one and also class three. So we are predicting two classes for this data point, meaning that this is a little bit a more difficult um, test data point to, to predict, right? And, and the same thing happens with the, with the third data point or test data point here. But then for the fourth one, again, you can see that we are confident that only belongs to the class one because the other two ones are uh, falses here. So what this means is that now we can find the average uh, or mean width of the prediction set. How you can do this? You can add um, the elements of this metrics row-wise, meaning that how many 
trues or ones we have uh, in each row and then find the average, right? So this means that an average here, the prediction set size is 1.225, which is a good number, right? You had three classes and on average here, we get 1.225 um, labels out of this pred conformal prediction, which means that this classifier is relatively um, confident. We can also see the other measure that we have here is about like this, whether we, we are satisfying that one minus alpha coverage level that, that we set before. And in order to do that, you know, you can just go through these elements of these uh, metrics that we have here and at each row, look at what the actual output should be and whether we have a true or false there, right? So that's that's what we do here, right? So we're indexing this by Y test, which is the ground truth, uh, set of ground truth outputs. And you can see that in most cases, we actually have true, which means that the, the prediction set contains the actual um, output. And now if you want to know exactly the, the, the portion of them um, or the fraction of data points that I satisfy that, you can look at this dot mean um, and you can see that now 96% of the time, you know, we, we have a prediction set that contains the actual output. And this is great news, right? Because we wanted to get at least 95%. So in the next experiment, let's uh, increase alpha from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. And in this case, we want to find that um, first to see whether we have the coverage uh, property that we want. So we get here 91% of time, the prediction set contains the actual output. And then the average prediction set size, right? That's where the, we find the sum across rows and then find the mean. You can see that we get 1.025. And the reason this is happening is that remember, as you increase alpha, right? Then, then what happens is that um, if if we if we if we go back to this figure, that would be like the easiest way to explain this, right? When we increase alpha to like let's say 0.1, right? Then um, the, the 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 quantile that we have here, right? Let's look at this one minus um, q hat, right? So this will increase eventually, and this means that now um, it's uh, less likely that we add more class labels to our prediction set. That's why you can see that here, when we increase alpha from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, the average prediction set size is now a little bit smaller than before because before we got 1.225, now we get 1.025. Uh, So now let's go um, talk about full conformal prediction. So what we just talked about is known as a split conformal prediction because of the fact that we split the data into training and, 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 and calibration sets. In full conformal prediction, we want to get the guaranteed coverage without splitting the data. And, but we still follow the same rules and, and principles. And one very nice work that explains this idea is this work by um, uh, Candace and Tip Shirani, which is a relatively recent work, and it's called Predictive Inference with the Jackknife Plus. And so you can look at this link um, uh, for this paper. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, let's say in a very um, you know simple case, we can use leave one out method, meaning that you use a cross validation where each fold only contains one data point. And then you're going to remove that one data point to find um, the, the, the residual, uh, which means that you're going to train the model on other data points that, that you have left, the n minus one data points. And then you're going to look at the predicted value that you get for the test data point and plus minus this residual. And you repeat this same process for all the uh, you know n data points that you have in, in available uh, before the tasting phase. And then you look at these uh, quantiles to form the upper bound and, and lower bound. So just to formalize these, so you have a data set that is given to you. This time we are not gonna just split it to training and calibration. Instead, we are using like cross-validation, uh, a stellar k-fold, uh, where we divide the data into k uh, disjoint subsets. And this notation here with negative d subscript k means that we're gonna remove that fold uh, indexed by K when we want to do model training. So this allows us to find the residuals for those data points that are there 
um, that, that's the formula here. So this ki tells us what fold that data point index i belongs to so that we can remove it and we can do training. And now we can do testing and finding residuals. And then we can build a prediction set uh, by finding these two quantiles of predicted values plus residuals and minus residuals. So the, for the upper bound, we use the one minus alpha. And the, for the lower bound, we just use the alpha and plus one the smallest of these um, residuals that, that we have here. So that's like a modification of the original uh, softmax uh, soft scores or the conformity scores that we, we had before. Okay, so now let's implement these and see how, how this works. So, you know, we're going to again create a, a synthetic data set for, for reproducibility. Um, and you can see that here the, the X values, it's one dimensional and they're uniformly distributed from zero to 10. And then we have some Gaussian noise. And the, the, the way that we connect outputs and inputs is this quadratic function, right? So 0. 0.5 times X squared uh, plus one times x or plus x and plus some noise, right? So this is the synthetic data set that we have. And now for different test data points, we want to see whether we can find a prediction uh, interval. And you can see that here, um, you know, uh, what we do is that for the test data points, I call them here target, uh, we're going to divide this interval 2 to 8 to 5 equally spaced points. So meaning that I want to test this model at 2. Uh, 3.5, 5, 6.5, and, and 8. And in this case, we're going to also use a, a, a neural network model from uh, Keras. So we're using the sequential model. We use one hidden layer uh, with two hidden units. Please ignore here that it says 10 is actually 2. Uh, and then we are using uh, exponen exponential linear unit as the activation function. And then one neuron in the output layer. And then you compile your model. And then what we do here, in order to do the, the k-fold uh, cross-validation, we just use this k-fold from scikit-learn, and we divide the data into 10 groups or splits. Uh, splits. Uh, and then we are going to use this for loop to go through all these training and testing indices for each time that we have one uh, fold for, uh, for testing and the rest of them for, for training. And then I create these two arrays, one array of size of the input data points, that's for residuals. Um, and then I'm gonna have these uh, predicted values, um, which is a two dimensional array, because in general, you may have more than one test data point that you want to find the interval for, for that data point. Uh, so in that case, we can do all at the same time. But other than that, everything here is very uh, like normal. So we, we just do model fitting on the training indices or the data points with the training indices. Uh, with here like 1,000 epochs, and then we can find the residuals by subtracting the values of the test indices that come from here uh, with the predicted values. And then for the uh, target data, where we want to find the prediction intervals, we can predict uh, what the sort of like the, the values for this X target. But something that also you know to know is that for all the data points that belong to one fold, uh, then uh, what, what happens is that uh, they have the same predicted values for that target data point. That's why we're going to use this np.repeat where you know we're going to repeat uh, this value uh, with this amount, the amount of test indices that we have in this cross-validation um, for loop that we have. And here we set the alpha equals to one once we write this function, and uh, we are going to... Uh, uh, find these sort of like quantiles like for the lower values and or lower limits and the upper limits. So the alpha and one minus alpha, that's the difference. And so um, in this case, we, we let this, uh, we, can, we can run this. Um, and, and then you can see that you can find an array for the lower values, an array for, um, another array for upper values. And now we can just plot these things, right? So here we have our um, samples that, that 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 we have, and you can see that we have these lower limits and upper limits, and these are the intervals that that we have. And this is really cool because it tells you also about the uncertainty of this prediction model um, that we have. I hope you found this video on conformal prediction helpful. Thanks for watching.